what truth I want to talk to you about today is a truth about prayer that is persistent. Now, we have talked about that we are not changing God's mind. In fact, we are laying hold of that which God already wants to give us. Then the question comes, why do I have to ask twice? And it can be said that it, it may at first glance seem unnecessary for us to come to God again. But one thing that is undeniable, the Bible tells us when we persist in prayer, God is well pleased. It's a conversation between us and God. If me persisting with a prayer request is not to remind God because God already knew, it's not necessarily for God's benefit, who would benefit from persistent prayer? If it's me and him, and it's not for him, it must be for me. What we will see today, if you have a copy of God's word, I encourage you to make your way to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. What we will see today is how persistent prayer changes things. How God has told us that if we continue in prayer, that we will be better for it. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, there is a parable that Jesus gives us how that we might pray persistently without losing heart. Take a look. If you found the place, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18. And as you have found a place and as you are able, would you stand with me? Out of respect for God's holy, written, inerrant word. The Bible says, verse 1 of chapter 18, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Would you pray with me? Father, as we are confronted with the truth that you want us to pray persistently. Lord, I pray that you just help us to understand how our lives can be changed by an attitude of persistent prayer. Through this, Father, we just pray we'd leave here better than when we came because we ask it in Christ's name. And amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So when people come to this parable, there's usually one of two ideas they will get. They're either going to say persistent prayer is a continual prayer. That is, I come to God often, but what I'm coming to God with is not necessarily redundant, or I'm not necessarily asking God for the same thing. Other people would say it's a continued prayer. That I would continue bringing the things to God that I have in my life that I would need. Now this passage is giving us a principle that God, who is very just, will give us those things that we hold to persistently. Persistence as in not giving up. Persistence as continuing. Now, at first glance, you might think, does that mean God wants to be nagged?
Shouldn't be a difficult question. Do you like being nagged? Uh, it's, it's not that we're coming to God and just redundantly just saying the same thing over and over and over. But it is saying that if I have something that is in God's will that he has for whatever reason not yet given to me, that I would continually come to him seeking that which he has promised me. What do we call that? Having assurance of something that we do not yet have. We call it faith. Is, is it any surprise he says, nevertheless, will the Son of Man come? Will he find faith on the earth? And faith pointing towards the future. We don't just call that faith. Faith pointing towards future things. What do we call that? Hope. So this is the main idea I want you to get. This is a, a big idea. If you get this, this is it. Write this down. I, if inside your bulletin, I jotted this down. Persistence in prayer will keep me holding on to hope. Persistence in prayer. When I continue to bring things before God, I am saying that I know God will give me this. Now, it is true that not everything I ask God for, he will give me. But those things that I ask for in his will, he will give me. It may not be exactly when I would want him to give it to me. That's where hope comes in. We stand now in a world that is, is dark and seems almost hopeless. How much more should we as people of God be ambassadors of great hope? Knowing that God is still in control. Knowing that God is still good. Take a look at this first video. Hope? Yeah. That's what all I got, really. <laughs> what do you hope for? Well, I'm going to be 80. I hope for another five. OK. When you lack hope, how do you get it back? How do I get it back? Think about all the past good times I had. Where does hope come from? Where does it come from? Believing. Believing in? What? Most anything that's been good. Hope comes from uh, within. You gotta have, uh, I guess, faith. Faith in humanity. All right, go ahead and ask me a question. Okay. Do you have hope? Uh, not really. No. Why not? I just live every day like it's the last. Um. I've had a lot of loss in the last three or four years. Did you have more hope before that, you think? Uh, not really. No. I'm, uh, I'm a depressive kind of guy. Okay. I take pills. Okay. <laughs> because you could be in a hopeless situation, and, there, and there's always a time for hope. I mean, it's just around every corner. Do I have hope? Oh, yes. Why? Lord Jesus Christ. How does, the, how does he give you hope? Faith, knowing that it's gonna, you know, everything's going to be OK, being certain of that. How are you certain of it? By faith. That's what. That's what. That's how the ancients. Uh, that's how the ancients please God. Is by faith. I don't know if you're in need of an infusion of hope. 
But when we persist in prayer, the demonstration of our faith at continually coming to God resonates with our soul and gives us hope. Not hope in humanity, not hope in my past good works, hope simply in God. So what I want to look at is as we look at this parable, why we should persist in prayer so that we might have hope. The first thing that we have to understand in this parable is God is not the unrighteous judge. I mean, look again in the text. He said in verse 2, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Is this parable saying God is like that guy? No, in fact, it's the antithesis. It said this guy was eventually persuaded through persistence. How much more will God be blessed with our persistence? So I wrote it down this way, point number one. When I pray persistently, I am recognizing that God is gracious and he wants to meet my needs. We've said this before. We are not changing God's mind. We are laying hold of his willingness to do that which he wants to do. Now, it is true that at times you come to God with a request in faith and God may not immediately answer. What should you do? You would persist in prayer because you know that God is gracious and he wants to give you those needs. So what we are doing is we are positioning our faith not in what we know may happen, but we are positioning our faith in who we know. I wrote it down this way under point number one. I can be confident in God's character. I can be confident not in what I will get, but I can be confident in who will give it to me. You remember the blind man came up to Jesus and it was kind of surprising that Jesus might ask this, but he says, what do you want me to do? The blind man says, I'd like to have my sight. So Jesus asked him another question. Do you believe I am able? Yes, Lord, I believe. He says, according to your faith, let it be done unto you. We were not taking the element of faith and saying, okay, God, I've got enough faith, so I'm going to twist your arm into doing what I want you to do. That's not the case. But rather, when we come to God, we are trusting in who He is. That what He wants to do is good. So, when we come to God, if God gives us exactly what we want, all the time, what does that make us? If every time I come to God and say, God... It's time for my new Jaguar. I mean, every time, whatever it was, I just come to God and God just hands it to me. Doesn't that diminish God to being my servant? But instead, when I come to God, I say, God, you are good. Here, this is what I would like. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So when James tells us, he reminds us, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. But if you ask, you may not have. Why? You ask amiss. In other words, you're asking for something that is outside of God's will. You may be coming to God and thinking, God, I need this. But God is gracious. And if he doesn't give it to you, it might be that you really don't need it. 
Because again, point number one, God is gracious. He wants to meet my needs. The Bible tells us, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So when we come to God, we believe that he will meet our needs. Now here's a really important question. If I ask God for something that is not a need, how will I know that I am asking for something that is outside his will? I mean, sure, I could just come to God and say, God, would you just bless the world? Amen. God, would you just give me whatever it is that you're going to give me? We are communicating with God. And when we communicate with God, we are bringing our desires to his will. And the more time we spend in prayer, the more we recognize the difference between our desires and his will. So it's very precisely because of persistent prayer that I will be better by asking for things that are more in God's will. Think of it like this. In the Gospel of Matthew, and I think this will be up on your screen, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, Jesus is giving us an example on how to pray. He's, he's talking about how that we might pray, not like the rest of the Gentiles do, but that we might pray differently. And what he's saying in, in Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about don't just heap on words over and over and over. In other words, don't just come to God and say, here it is, here it is, here it is. But when you pray, pray like this. What did he say? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, think of this. Was Jesus in this very instance saying you ought to pray this prayer every day? No. In fact, he was not saying just keep saying the same thing over and over again. In fact, he said before that, don't keep saying the same thing over and over again. In other words, I better refine my request when I persist in prayer. Take a look at this second video. There are times that me and God do not talk, and that is not God's fault. That is mine. I just get so busy. And so when I do end up talking to God, I really just try to impress him, give him a show, to just to show him how much I love him. So excuse me, will you, as I pray to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, Heavenly Father, beseech me not unto thee. How now? Brown cow, oh, thy soul is so dry, and if I can just catch a morsel of who you are, so verily, merrily, down the stream. When I like to get my prayer on, uh, there's some things I keep in mind. You need to keep lists of things. My list currently has 745 prayer requests on them. So then when I go to the Lord in prayer, it looks a little something like this. I'll just pray real quick. Um, let's see, the uno thing on my list is my mom, and so I'll pray for her now. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up this sweet salt of the earth lady that you have blessed me with to be my mother, and I tell you thank you. And although I know that I'm called to respect her, and I give her all due respect, there's also an issue of something she truly needs, and that is to stop a yapping. Lord, she yaps. And she doesn't know how to stop yapping. So could you please make her mute just for a day? Nothing permanent. Don't hurt her. I love her. Just mute her. Take your big God remote and push mute on her channel. That would be great. Henceforth, I would go on and pray all 746 things. God, you are greater than anything this world has to offer. And I can't wait for you to come back and get us. But until that time comes, would you help me just to 
just to live my life day after day as if I'm just walking hand in hand with you. God, I, I have a lot of needs, and I have a lot of wants. <laughs> and sometimes I get those things confused. Help me to just trust you to meet my needs and be thankful when you give me those other things that I just want. God, I have blown it so many times today, and I'm sorry. Thank you for your forgiveness. I don't take it for granted. And God, as I start this day out, I, I'm just reminded that this world is filled with so many spiritual potholes. Please help me to walk in such a way where I won't stumble so much. And as I'm going through this day, God, help me to live my life in such a way that would bring you glory and honor. May the life that I live be a life of worship to you. Amen. When Jesus gives us a pattern for prayer, embedded in that prayer is an idea of persistence. Notice he says, give us this day our daily bread. So tomorrow, I'm going to have to ask again. It may not just be every day I get up, say, God, give me the bread for today. Thank you. But each day, I would continue with the request. So there are some things that are never fully complete. I'll give you an example. In Colossians 1, Paul said this, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So he's saying, I continually pray for you that you would better know what God's will is. And one of the greatest things that allows us to hold on to hope, even though we might be praying outside of God's will, if we keep praying, we will find ourselves in God's will. I wrote it down this way, letter B under point number one. Persistent prayer will refine my requests. Persistent prayer will refine my request. You come to God in a conversation, and if you are not changed in that conversation, something's wrong. When we come into God's presence, we may come with what we think we need, but we leave with what God knows we need. The best example I thought of as I was preparing this message was by a man named Jacob. In the Old Testament book of Genesis, Jacob was the twin brother of Esau. He was named Jacob, one who grasped as he was holding on to his, brother ankle, on his brother's ankle as he came out. And since then, Jacob had done some things he probably shouldn't have. Taking his brother's birthright, dressing up like his brother in order to take his brother's blessing. Although those were things that God wanted to give him, he tried to do them on his own strength. And based upon all that, there was a little bit of tension, as you could imagine, between two brothers. Anybody else have a brother that they fight with? So you have this brother that you, you don't necessarily get along with, but imagine it times a thousand, and you have Jacob and Esau. So Jacob is now coming back to where he was born. He was coming back to his homeland, but he was really concerned about Esau. So we see in Genesis chapter 32, I'm just going to give you the abridged version. Uh, Genesis chapter 32, Jacob prays by what he thinks he needs. He says in Genesis 32, Oh God, my father, the God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all deeds of your steadfast love and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. Sounds good. Please now deliver me from the hand of my brother for the hand of Esau, because I fear him that he may come and attack me. The mothers 
with the children. Now he tries to make it sound pretty good, you know, and safety is something that we need. But he comes to God and he says, God, on my mind, I am afraid. Give me safety. Now what we realize through Jacob's example is God had something else in mind. And we see in this chapter, Genesis 32, that Jacob gets in a grappling match, presumably with God. He comes to God and he says, give me safety for I am afraid. And he's wrestling with God, almost like he's trying to convince God to do what he wants. And this continues on all through the night. God is just continually keeping him at bay. And at any moment, he could have stopped the fight, but he didn't. Just as he won't prevent us from continually and struggling to say, God, I don't know what you want, but this is what I think you want. And the Bible says he he had enough. Daylight was coming. So he just touched Jacob's hip and it popped out of socket. Have I ever dislocated a hip? Does it hurt? But so here was Jacob. He came to God and said, God, I need you to give me safety. I am afraid. But then he realized who he was really grappling with. Then he thought to himself, this is God I'm talking to. Maybe I, I'm thinking a little small. So he, he got his mind off of his fear and got his mind onto his faith. And he said, okay, now, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He was fighting against God. Now he was fighting for God. He was worried just about escaping a beating from one man. And now he was concerned with getting a blessing over a nation he came to God with this request this is what I think I need and he wrestled with God over it but God had much much bigger plans for he changed Jacob's name to Israel so even though we may come to God with what we think we need we may be asking for the wrong thing But it's because we keep asking that our requests become refined as we grow closer to the God in whom we are talking. And that's how hope stays alive. Because I know God is good. And if he has not given me what I've asked for, it's because he has something else in mind. And though even though I may be afraid and I'm only focusing on my fear, he wants me to live by faith. So when I come to God, I can rest assured that if he does not give me what I ask, it's okay. Because he is good. Now there's a second thing that comes up. Certainly, If we are asking for something out of God's will, we're not going to get it. We're not trying to wrestle God and to make him tap and submit to our desires. But rather, in this process of persistent prayer, we become more acquainted with what God wants. But, what if what you want is what God wants? Is there perhaps a reason why he may not immediately give it to you? Yes, you might say, God, I want this. And God says, this word, I'm, I apologize in advance. I, I usually don't say this word, but I will uh, today. God will look at us when we ask for some things. You know what he'll say? Wait. He's not saying no. He is saying yes, but he's saying yes, but wait. Now, does that mean I ask God and say, God, here it is. And he says, wait. What does that do to our persistence? 
Well, in the parable, the woman came and didn't get what she thought she needed. So what did she do? She continued nagging this unjust judge. But we are talking about a just heavenly father who's gracious. So although we trust that he is gracious and that he wants to give us great things according to our need, if he doesn't, it is either because we really don't need it or now is not the time for it. So I wrote this down, point number two. God is sovereign and he works within his time. I hold on to persistent prayer. I am holding on to hope. Because I am either holding on to the fact of what I want, I will not get, but I will get something much better. Or I'm holding on to what I think I want is what God wants, but he wants to give it to me later. And as much as I know first that God is good, I also know that God is in control. So the question becomes, why then, a God who has everything in control, why does he want me to continually ask him for what he wants to give me? Sure, he can't give it to me now. Okay, I've got that. But why do I keep asking for it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Obviously, we could argue prayer changes us. Again, the idea if I came to God and got whatever I want whenever I wanted it might be a problem for me, not a real blessing. In fact, I thank God for many prayers he said no to. And with that, when I come to God, I will be better. I will learn I am not the center of my own universe. I will learn that it's not my way or the highway. I will learn that God is good and he is in control. So I wrote this down for letter A under point number two. I can trust in God's timing. I can trust in God's timing. So if I'm trusting in God's character, I know he's going to give me what I need. And if he doesn't give me what I think I need, I must not need it. But if he doesn't give me when I think I want it or think I need it, I, I must believe that he's going to give it to me when I do need it or when he can give it. I can give you a couple of examples in my life, things that I fasted and prayed for and prayed for. I went off to seminary. I was called to be a pastor, and I was 24 years old. And uh, I got to seminary, and I said, God, you've called me to do this. Now give me a church. I mean, you asked me to be a pastor. Here I am. Pastor needs a church. So, you know. Now, I was in a ministry at a church. I was a, an associate pastor over the youth, and uh, I was doing good things, but I, I really felt called to, to be a preaching and teaching pastor. But you know, an interesting thing. God knew best. If I would have come right at the very beginning, right after God called me to ministry, and I'd taken into a church... You know what the average tenure of a pastor right out of seminary is? Like 18 months. Why do you think that is? You already know why it is. I'm just saying. But God in his great sovereignty chose to give me a couple years under a wise man that taught me how to be a better pastor before he turned me loose on my own church. So God knows best. But still the question is, why does God want us to keep asking? Think about this. We know God is good. We know God is sovereign. But why does he want us to keep asking? Well, again, 
In my prayer life, it's a relationship between me and him. Am I continually bringing it before him for his benefit? Then it must be for mine. So the question is, how do you benefit from coming to God again and again and again? If you think about the thing that you need, if you think about the thing that you've been most persistent with in prayer, would you consider that desire, that need, a burden? Would you define that which you regularly beseech God for? I mean, you may be praying for a family member. You, you may be praying for something in your own life about your own health or wellness. It, it may be something, I, I don't know what it may be for you. But would you say that, whatever that is, is a burden? Okay, yes, just say it with me. Yes, okay, thank you. So we have this burden and we carry it. But what happens when we realize God is good, God is in control, and I give it to him? What am I doing? I'm letting him have it. Now, if you're anything like me, you pick it back up pretty quickly. So what should I do? Give it back to him. Turn and look at somebody and tell them God is in control. Now tell them, you can let it go. Do you believe that, church? God is in control. You can let it go. When I come to God, when I'm regularly bringing something before Him, I am blessed by the privilege of laying down my burdens. So certainly, I will be better for it. I wrote it down this way under point number two. Persistent prayer will alleviate my anxiety. If I have a burden, and it may be that I'm asking for the wrong thing, but as I continue to ask, I will refine my request. But if it is a right burden, a righteous burden that I carry but yet it's not the right time, God will alleviate any anxiety. Because as I trust Him, as I hold on to hope, I know God is in control. And I can let it go. It doesn't surprise us that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and said, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He's saying you can get past even that unsettled feeling by simply giving it to God. And it says in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Persistent prayer, not for God's benefit, but for mine. To regularly set my burdens down. And remember, God is in control. I can let it go. Uh, the main idea I want you to get from this, I want to remind you, persistent prayer, persistence in prayer will keep me holding on to hope. It will either give me great illumination, helping me understand what I should be praying for. It certainly will give me divine intervention, or God will give me that which I need. So as we come to this, we remember how God has planned for us to persist in prayer. A couple conclu concluding points, and I'll wrap this up. Two things. First of all, I need to be content when God says no. Persistent prayer is not trying to convince God. And there are times when God says no. You remember Paul and his thorn in the flesh? 
he was persistent. He, he got to the third time saying, God, I really like it if you take this off of me. And God just said, no. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For in your weakness, my strength is perfected. So Paul was okay with that. Now, the question becomes, how do I know if it is God's will or if God is saying no? Well, the Bible gives us a lot of different ways in which we can determine God's will. Certainly by asking him, God, if this is not your will, take this desire from me. You certainly could compare what you want with what the Bible says to make sure what you desire is something God wants you to desire. You could even seek a multitude of counselors and in those people trusting their spiritual insight to ask, is this something that I should hold on to or is this something God is telling me no? But here's the point. If God has not said no, there's all kinds of hope. You may not understand what God's doing, but God is in control. You can let it go. Last video. I've heard it. You've heard it. It's time for a new beginning. Time to start a fresh page or paint a new picture with our life. Sounds great in theory, but it can seem impossible. Life is messy. The lines have gotten blurred. Maybe we just don't know where to start. We look at the canvas of our lives and see mistake after mistake after mistake. It's overwhelming. When I look at my life with these messy lines and scribbles, it makes me think, is this as good as it gets? There's no eraser that can make this life make sense. But what if? What if there was someone that could make sense of our mess? They could take all our scribbles, all our mistakes, all our missed opportunities, and make them into a masterpiece. And then I remember, there is Jesus. He gives us a new life. Every day is new. Every day is a blank canvas full of possibility and promise. He takes our canvases, our lives that have been filled up with shortcomings, secrets, tragedies, and embarrassments, and he helps them make sense. When I look at the canvas of my life and I see nothing but disorder and chaos, I have to remember this. God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of peace. And you know what? He wants to take my hand and bring peace to the canvas of my life. So as we seek to make our mark, let us give God all our scribbles, all our mistakes, all our hurts, and trust that he will turn our messy lives into a masterpiece, his masterpiece. When God says no, I should be content. But if God has not, said no I should persist last thing I wrote down was this I need to be consistent while waiting on God persistent prayer is bringing something to God for my benefit but reminding myself that God is good and God is in control and when he gives me what I need at the time I need it, it will be good. But until that time, I should persist. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much that as we're reminded of the importance of persistent prayer, 
that, Father, we can trust in your character. You are good. So if you choose not to give us something, it's for our benefit. Lord, help us to trust your will. And Lord, as we remind ourselves not only that you are of good character, that you are in complete control. So Father, we come to you not trying to encourage you to do that which you do not want to do, but we come to you laying hold of your willingness. And when it is the right time, you give us what we need. But help us to have the faith, Lord, to let it go until you do. This we pray in Christ's name. God's people said,